Y'all ready for Thanksgiving? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I can't believe it's this week. That's really soon. Um. Yeah, do you get time off from work or? It probably doesn't really affect your classes, right? Because you probably don't have any classes no, during yeah. Thanksgiving anyway. I have one of my classes we don't meet on the Wednesday before. And then I get one day off work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, has anyone did anything uh, fun this week, this weekend, or anything interesting? Let's see, what did I do? I didn't, I didn't really do anything that cool. <laughs> I did some house projects, but I'd had like a basement project that I bought the wood for like a year and a half ago. And the wood had just been laying in my basement for like a year and a half, so I finally got around to finishing it. So that was kind of nice. So you didn't have to step over this pile of <laughs> boards. Well, it was actually uh, the baseboard and the shoe molding for the basement. Like I had put in a floor, and I I just had that last step to do, but I've been putting it off for like a year and a half. So yeah, I, I'm not very good at it either, but. The people that built my house were even worse at it, so they make me look like I'm really good at it. Like, <laughs> like you're supposed to like when the the corners go together, like you you cut them out of 45, so they look really nice. And like they just like would cut it off square and like put them together like that. And um, so I'm like, well, it looks better than the old stuff looked. So even if it's got a gap, it still looks better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard. I, I haven't caulked it yet, so I just need to do that. Okay. All right, so um, has, has everyone uh, come up with a, at least one project idea yet for, uh, I haven't looked in a while at the website, but I saw that a lot of people had posted project ideas. Um, uh, they, looked, they looked pretty cool. I liked, I liked all of them a lot. Um, has, any, has anyone not posted a project idea yet or? Uh, Nice, nice, cool. Um, so I was looking at the the syllabus. For some reason, I was thinking we were going to have like a week off because of Thanksgiving. And then I was like, wait, that doesn't make sense. It's only this Wednesday to to Friday that you have off. So um, we're we're right here on the twenty third of November, and we've got this class and then three more classes and then um, the class is over and uh, for the final project um, Eric sent out a email and was saying that you know we can if you want to you can make your final project count towards another class if you have another class that is doing a final project we can probably work that out um, but also I think in the past they've done almost like a, a science fair where everyone gets together and presents their projects. But since we have COVID now, they're, they're thinking we'll do like a two or three minute video. So everyone, you'll record a two or three minute video about your project. And then we'll just show like all those videos to people at the, the end. And I think that's on December 17th. So our, our final exam uh, on here, I have December 16th of December, 2002. Um, it's not 2002, it's 2020. But so the day after that is when they're going to show the, the videos. Um, and I forget the time, but I'll, I'll look that up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not 
nothing crazy, like two or three minutes, just talk about your project and what you did. Um, and we really need to go ahead and, uh, if, you know, if there's, especially if there's parts you need for your project, like as soon as possible, we need to get those ordered so that you can get those in and start uh, building your stuff. Um, do it, have any of y'all figured out that you will need some supplies you're going to buy or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're doing like a display case, right? That's pretty cool. So do you have a case already that you're going to modify? That's so you're going to build like a display case? That's pretty cool. What are you going to build it out of? Like, uh, I was thinking like a thinner, like a basket wood. Okay. Maybe like two or three layers for some of the parts that I couldn't build. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I will definitely not build help with the construction part of it, but I can help with the electronic part of it. That will be cool. Um, and I was thinking that like for the last three classes, really what we'll do is just kind of um, you can work on your projects in class to so bring stuff and you know if you have questions like I can help answer them while you're in class and stuff and if you need materials we can work on them um, today I'm, I'm just going to mainly uh, I want to go over a little bit more coding in Arduino because I feel like that's something people uh, are having a hard time with is coding in Arduino um, so I wanted to go over some coding examples but if y'all have any questions about your project today, I can also talk about them. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, the semester is quickly coming to an end. Um, are any of y'all planning on taking the second semester of this class next semester? The uh, yeah, that'll be cool. So we'll have to figure out what. Hopefully we can build off of what we learned in this class and take it take it farther. Um, so I don't think we're going to get to brushless DC motors unless no one has any questions the next couple of classes. Um, so that might be something we do next semester. But the the main thing is like if you can code your feather to drive a stepper motor and a DC motor and a servo motor like you won't have any trouble um, figuring out how to use a, a brushless dc motor especially because normally you buy like you just buy a brushless speed controller and then you you control it almost the same way you would like a servo motor or something like that it's just uh it kind of takes care of all the, the hard work but it's still cool to understand how they work and how the motors work um, so let me open up Arduino. So last class, someone was saying, uh, asking if I could go over like for loops in Arduino because for their project, they were doing some for loops. And so I was talking about for loops for a while. And then I realized that if you go to examples and control, they actually have like a section on for loops and a section on um, if statements and while statements so that's something good to keep in mind is if you're wondering how to do something in Arduino how to code something spend some time looking through all these examples and there might be something really close to what you're trying to do and that's that's honestly the easiest way to do it because um, I was I was also saying last class I almost never just start out with like um, with a totally blank you know Arduino um, program and just start typing and start from scratch because I have so much trouble remembering like all the things you need even if it's just like a really simple one if I open up the blinking light uh, it's got you know the setup and the loop functions already and you know then I can add stuff if I want to um, so I recommend definitely doing that instead of just trying to start and remember how to how to do everything um, so another question I got is why, what is, why does it have this word void before the setup function and the loop function? Does anyone have any ideas why that, what that means or? I was always curious about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Um, if you remember in C and C++ and Arduino, they're all really like very similar, pretty much the same thing. Uh, I guess Arduino is C++, which is a slightly modified version of C, but it's all like pretty much the same. Um, you can make a variable called like my variable equals five. And um, in C, uh, almost every line has to end with a semicolon. That's something different than Python. In Python, you didn't use semicolons. Um, but that lets it know, know that it's the end of that line. Um, and this would work in CircuitPython, but if I just type this, it's going to give me an error. It's going to say, my variable does not name a type. So does anyone know what that means? Why can't I set my variable equal to 5? Do you remember what uh, variable types are? Like, um, exactly. Yeah, that's what the types are. It's like, it's like, um, is it an integer, a string, a float, or a character? There's those are different types of variables. So I need to say, the most common one you're going to use is an integer, which is int. So I'm saying I'm making an integer called my variable. And I'm going to set it equal to 5. And then that won't give me a problem. Um, the main ones you're going to use, or the main one is integer, like I said. But um, you can also look up like Arduino types, I think. That should, that should give you a good. That's not what I meant. Whoops. Maybe data types. Yeah, so here's some of the data types. Um, but like I said, you're mainly going to use int all the time. Um, does anyone remember what is a, uh, what does a float mean? Decimal. Yeah, it has a decimal point. Um, but you're, you're going to try to, you want to stay away from floats if you can, because on a laptop, they're fine. You can use floats all day, but on a microcontroller, it's a lot slower to do stuff with floats than it is with um, integers. So if you can, uh, like say that you're measuring um, a distance with a sensor and it's coming back in, um, in centimeters. Um, you know, and so say like you could, it could be 12.23 centimeters. You could do a float. But if you want to avoid using a float, you could um, like shift the decimal place over and just remember, like, hey, instead of centimeters, this is tenths of a millimeter or something like that. Like that way, it's always going to be a whole number, and then you can just remember you have to shift the decimal place back later. Um, does anyone remember the two functions that you have to have in an Arduino program? And by remember, I also mean like read. There's a big hint on the the board, not the board, but the screen. Big hint on the screen. So there's one function that does everything needed to set up the stuff, and then there's the other one that loops over and over. Does anyone remember? Yep, so, so setup and loop are the two. Yep, that was a big hint. So setup just runs once, and that sets up everything. And then once that's done, it starts running loop, and that happens over and over again. Um, so anytime you make a function, um, when you make a variable, like this is a variable, you have to give it a type. And when you make a function, the way that works is you have to name the function like my function, and then you tell it like, it, ca it can take certain uh, arguments, which is like, say that I wanted to make a function called like square, 
square number and then you put in a number and then um, in C you use curly brackets to indicate a block of code so after you do a function you do an open and a closed curly bracket and everything inside the curly bracket is part of the function so um, I could just say return x times x and that's my function um, but if I run it it says expected constructor destructor or type conversion before parentheses um, does anyone have an idea why that function didn't work very well it doesn't like it so it turns out in C um, for one thing you have to tell it what type of variable is the argument you're passing so X it doesn't know if it's an integer or a float or what so you have to say it's it's going to take an integer X and then it it knows and not only that um, you also have to tell it what kind of variable it's going to return so here I'm taking an integer and I'm squaring it and I'm returning that that number so what kind of a number am I returning yeah it's, it's also an integer so what you do is in front of the the function you put int which means this function returns an integer and also it takes an integer called X so some functions though they don't return anything and if that's the case you put void in front of it which means it doesn't return anything so setup is a function but it doesn't need to return a value so that's why um, you put void in front of it and um, loop is the same way it doesn't return anything it's, it just runs and they don't even take any any arguments like you don't have to pass anything to function I mean to set up or to loop um, but some sometimes you do want to pass in a number and get a number back so let's see if that so yeah it was fine it's fine now because I told it the return type and the um, the type that it um, the argument takes and it gave me an error because the board's not hooked up but if I plug up my board it should work so let's go ahead and talk about um, let's talk about if statements that's kind of a good thing to talk about so this code it reads an analog input and turns on an LED if it goes above a certain threshold so here at the beginning what are what are what does this highlighted part do yeah so they're saying the analog pin is pin a0 the LED pin is pin 13 and they're saying we're going to set the threshold to be 400 um, now they're doing something that you don't have to do this is optional but um, this word const c-o-n-s-t that lets the compiler know that this is a constant that's never going to change so like all throughout the code analog pin is going to be a, a zero and LED pin is going to be 13 um, and that can like make your code use less space and be faster but if you don't do it it's not a big deal because we're not we're not super worried about you know we're not using up all our memory or all our speed or anything um, a lot of times I don't do that you, you can just say they're all integers so so one question is how is it that this is an integer if it's equal to um, a0 like this is a number 13 but what about a0 Does anyone know what that does let's see yeah so this is just 
A0 is actually um, a pin number. So like, it's not really, it's not a string. Like if it was in parentheses, that would be a string like A0, like the letter A and the letter, the number zero. But A0 apparently, it's the pin number of analog input zero, whatever that is. So let me see real quick if I can figure out what it is. Um, I'm gonna try to have it print out Um, what a zero is over and over because I don't, I don't know what it is um, so I made another loop function you, you can't have two so I'm going to comment out this one um, and there's two different ways to comment out stuff you can put um, two forward slashes in front of it and that comments out one line and if you want to come out a bunch of lines and see you do forward slash and then star and and then to end it in the comment you do star forward slash so it's like that's a way if you have a bunch of lines of code you want to comment out um, if I run this let's see so for it's, it's putting out 14 over and over so apparently um, see that that's from this line which is print line A0. So apparently A0 is just pin 14. So that's why I was able, that's an integer because 14 is an integer. So um, it's just a pin number. Um, oh, I froze everything. Use this command that Will taught me. Did I kill a bunch too? Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, that scared me. I didn't want to kill a bunch too. Um. All right, so I'm gonna uncomment the loop again. Um. In the setup, we are making the LED pin an output, and then starting the serial communications. Um, and the speed that we're starting it at is 9600 baud, which is, if you if you all remember, that's just the most common one that you'll see. It's kind of like, it could be almost any number. Um, that's just the speed of it, but like 9600 is probably the most common serial speed you'll find. So just leave it at 9600. Um, then we're reading in an analog value from the analog pin. And if you notice, it's an integer. So why is it an integer? Isn't it a voltage that it's reading? And, and aren't voltages normally have a, a decimal point? What do you think analog read returns? Is it? Is it the voltage on the pin in volts? The position of the potentiometer? Yeah, but it's, so that's true, but it, it's, the potentiometer changes the voltage between 0 and 3.3. But the reason that it's kind of confusing is analog read, it doesn't return the actual voltage. It returns, if you remember, the number of steps in your ADC. Um, so like, if you want to convert it to a voltage, you have to figure out how many steps are in your ADC and then divide it to find out what voltage that corresponds to. So it's kind of like um, this is uh, by default, it's a it's a 10 bit ADC. So that means that 3.3 uh, volts, which is the highest voltage you can measure, is 1023 and then zero volts is zero and these are like the steps so when you do an analog read you're not actually reading the voltage you're reading at which step it's on and the reason it's 1023 is this is a 10 bit analog to digital converter the more bits it is the better and the better the resolution and that means like the more steps because you can imagine if you had a um, how many steps would a 
a four bit um, if I had a four bit ADC, how many steps would that have? Yeah, it's it's the number of steps is just two to the fourth. Because like a four bit ADC means they could be you've got one, two, three, four bits. And so if you have a four bit binary number, um, each one of these can be a zero or a one. So it could be zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero. Like this is counting up in binary. The highest you can count is one, 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 one. And um, if, you know, if you know your binary math, this is one plus two plus four plus eight. So that's um, 12, uh, 14, 15. Um, so it can go from zero all the way to 15. And since you have zero included, that's 16 different values. So there's 16 steps. But the really easy way to remember this is if you have a 4-bit ADC, it's 2 to the 4th power number of steps. And a 10-bit and a ADC is just 2 to the 10th power steps. Does anyone know what, what, what ten, 2 to the 10th is off the top of their head? Um, based off the fact that I said that this is a 10-bit ADC, and the highest and go is 1023. How many steps, or what do you think two to the tenth is? 496. That's that's close. That I think that's that's two more. Yeah, you went a little bit. That's 12. You went too far. It's it's just uh, 1024. Is is the number of steps. So two to the tenth is 1024, which means that um, the 10 bit ADC we have, it can go from zero up to 1023 because like since zero is included uh this is 1024 steps if that makes sense um oh yeah isn't that a game where you like yeah. do powers of two um it's kind of convenient i'm trying to remember what is it so it's kind of confusing like this, um, if you ever look up like uh, how big a kilobyte and a megabyte is and a gigabyte, you would think like, well, a kilobyte is 1,000 bytes, a megabyte is 1 million bytes, which makes sense, but it's like, if you look it up, um, let's see. Yeah, there's all these weird, so a megabyte is, oh, oh, it's called a mebibyte. It's 10 to the 24th times two. Anyway, this is kind of a tangent, but it's weird. It's just a coincidence that two to the 10th is almost a thousand. So like what people did is they say, well, since it's almost a thousand, let's call it two to the 10th, like a kilobyte or something like that because it's and then they're like well then two to the 20th is a thousand times bigger that's a megabyte even though it's not exactly this is actually 1024 and then this is um 1024 squared anyway just kind of a weird tangent that's why like if you ever see they're saying it's called a mebibyte i've never heard of that Yeah. Yeah, see, it says a common usage has been to designate one megabyte as 10 to the 20 uh, bytes, which is actually 1,048,576. So it's kind of weird. Like, I remember I saw that. I was like, why is a megabyte 1,048,576 bytes and not a million? Like, but it's because they're like, well, it's close to 2 to the 20th, so let's just call it that. Anyway, yeah, it's a, that's a weird tangent, but um, 
yeah. Anyway, so that was a long tangent. So let's get back to that. The the highest value that this can return is ten. To, oh, I'm sorry, is uh, one thousand twenty three, and the lowest value is zero. So that's why it's an integer. And say that like I do an analog read and I get like five hundred and seventy two steps back, where um, zero volts is zero steps, and then three point three volts is the max is ten twenty three. How would I figure out how many volts this is? So I say like I measured it and it's 572 volts. So it's going to be somewhere between 3.3 .3 and 0, but like how to figure out where exactly. Yeah, so so um, 3.3 .3 volts divided by 1023 steps. It'll tell you how many volts per step you get out. So then you just multiply that. So you have 572 st steps times this. And then you, you pull up Google. Because Google is the best calculator to use. 572 times 3.3 divided by 1023 so it's 1.845 volts does that does that kind of make sense how it's it's just like a different units kind of thing like it's just scaled you have to figure out what the scale factor is um, so then um, whatever the analog value is if it's bigger than the threshold, so if the analog value read, this means greater than, is greater than the threshold, write the LED pin high, and otherwise light, write it low. And then print it out the analog value on the uh, serial port. So what's the threshold? Do I remember what that was? Yep. So. If the analog value is greater than 400, make the LED high. Otherwise, make it low. So let me, let me upload this code. We can see it. So it's done uploading. And um, which pin is it reading the voltage on? Yeah, it's A0. So um, that's what this red wire is connected to. So see the LED? See when I touch the wire, it's like going on and off? It's kind of just floating. So apparently, when I don't touch it, it goes above a count of 400. But if I stick it in ground, it goes off because it should be at an analog reading around zero. And then if I take it and I put it um, at 3.3 .3 volts, it's just on solidly because it's above that. And if you look at the uh, serial monitor, see it's printing out the analog voltage and see it says 1023 because I have it plugged into 3.3 volts. If I unplug it, it should be floating in the middle somewhere. Yeah, see it's floating around 400. If I touch it, it goes down a little bit. I, I wouldn't know before I saw this if I touched it, if it would go up or down. It's kind of random. Like I could make it go higher. But then if I plug it into ground, It's not exactly zero, but it's pretty close to zero. So, so with an if statement, um, you you can change this, and um, I could say if the analog voltage is greater than or equal to. Um, let's see. There are. Let's see. 
so, so this is a good page. It has all of the what are called relational operators. Um, so if you see there's is equal to, not equal to, um, greater than, less than, greater than or equal, or less than or equal. This is good for like comparing numbers. So I could say if the analog value is greater than or equal to threshold, um, what would that one do? Here, so it's two equal signs. Look back here, what, is, what does that do? Yeah, so when would the LED light up like this? Yeah, so if the analog value is exactly 400, so that's almost never going to light up because, like, how likely is it that it's going to be exactly 400? Um, what about if I did that? Which one is that? That's so it's exclamation point equal. Yeah, so it's the opposite of the equal. It's saying if the analog value is not equal to the threshold, which means the LED is going to be on almost all the time because, like, how often was that not equal to 400? Like, it's almost, chances are it's not going to be 400. Um, and then there's other things you can do. You can combine, um, all of this is kind of like what they call um, Boolean logic or Boolean algebra. Have you all heard that term before? Like Boolean means like there's only two values, true or false. So um, this evaluates either to true or false. Like if I said analog value is greater than the threshold, it's either going to be greater or it's not going to be greater. It's either going to be true or false. If it's true, this is going to happen. Otherwise, this is going to happen in the code. But you can also combine them. Like I could have... Um, say like uh, make a button and do a digital read of my button pin so like this is going to be either a 0 or 1 depending if the buttons pressed so like if the buttons pushed the button value will be 1 and if it's not pushed it'll be um, 0 and so what I could say is like I want the LED to turn on if the va if the analog value is greater than the threshold and the button's pushed. So what you could do is um, to check if the button's pushed, you could say button value equals equals I think I think you can do high. Cuz like high they've defined it to be 1. Um, but I think you could also do 1. It wouldn't, either one would work. Um, and why do you think they do for equals, why is it two equal signs instead of just one equal sign? Like why not just say, to check if they're equal, just do one equal sign like that. It, the, the reason is I think it's mainly just to keep from confusing people because if I say if analog value equals threshold with one equal sign, it almost looks like I'm trying to assign analog value to equal this. So if you do two of them, it avoids that confusion. This two of them means you're checking are they equal. If you do one, it means you're assigning this value to analog value, if that makes sense. So make sure you always... I've done that before where I was trying to check if things are equal and just do one equal sign and it doesn't work. It'll, it'll actually make them equal and then it's weird. Um, so I'll, if I want the analog threat value to be above a threshold and I want the button value to equal high, does anyone have any ideas what I might 
do if I want both of those things to be true. I want it to be greater than this and I want it to be high. What should I do? In CircuitPython, what you could do is you could literally just type and, which is kind of nice, and it does and. And if I, if I want it to be or, I could do or. In C, it's the same thing. It's just that for and, you do two and signs. And for or, you do two vertical pipes. And then there's an exclamation point which inverts everything. So like if something's true and you put an exclamation point in front of it, it becomes false. So what you can do is um, if I want the LED to turn on when it's greater than threshold and the button is pressed, I do and like that. And if I, if I want it to be that's greater than threshold or the buttons pressed, I would do that, the two vertical pipes. So like this would be either one of these could make it the LED turn on. Um, and then you can do weird things like you, you can get really complicated and you could say you put an exclamation point in front of it. Now it's saying the inverse of if this is greater than threshold or this button is pressed. So it's like saying it gets really complicated, but it's not, if it's not true that the analog value is greater than threshold or the button value is high. Like, you know, you can get really complicated, but I don't advise doing that unless you have a good reason to. Does anyone know how to do a for loop in um, Arduino or C? So let's open up, go to ex examples, and then control, and there's a for loop one. So what this code is doing is it's looping from pin 2 up to pin 8 and it's turning them on, waiting a little bit and then turning it off. And then it's doing the opposite. It's going from pin 7 down to pin 2 and it's turning them off and on. So it would be kind of like you would see these LEDs cycling, pin 2 would turn on, pin 3, pin 4, pin 5. Um, but if you'll notice, there's three parts to a for loop. It's, it's four, and then there's something in the parentheses, and then there's um, an open and closed bracket, kind of like an if statement. So if you remember if statement was like if, and then an open and, um, and, and your code went here. And same thing, the, the code is here in a for statement. So in the, in the if statement, this was like something that's either true or false. In a for loop, you have a variable that you have to initialize. So I could call it like um, my, my variable, and you do a semicolon. And then there's a condition, kind of like an if statement. Um, and if this condition is true, the for loop keeps going. And if it's false, it stops. So I could say the condition is my my variable is less than a thousand. Then another semicolon, and then there's something that you can do to my variable at the end of every loop. So a lot of times, what you'll see is my my variable plus plus. Does anyone know what the plus plus means? Yep, exactly. You add one to it. So plus plus is the same thing as saying my variable equals my variable plus one. So w what that means is if you do the plus plus, it's a shorthand. Every time you go through this loop, um, you're going to add one to my variable. And that's going to keep happening until as long as it's less than a thousand, it's going to keep happening. So once it gets to a thousand, the for loop's going to stop. Um, 
but but this is a variable so you have to actually uh, tell it what type of variable it is so is it an integer it's almost always gonna be an integer for a for loop so what you what you need to do is say it's an integer and then what's missing from this so I'm telling it it's an integer I'm saying to add one to it every time and when to stop but what is my variable when I when it starts where does it start at the problem is we, we didn't tell it where to start so we need to tell it when you say let's start it at zero here so now um, it's gonna start at zero every time it goes through the loop we're gonna add one to it and as long as it's less than a thousand we're gonna continue so um, let's try this out get rid of their code I'm, I'm gonna have it printed out over serial so it's gonna be um, and I forget the syntax for serial so I'm gonna open up uh, I'm gonna open up the digital read serial oh yeah you just have to do serial dot begin it's pretty easy and that goes in setup and then serial.println prints out a line. So I'm going to print out my variable. So what, what do you think is going to happen? What am I going to see when I run this code on the serial monitor? Sorry, that's not the code. Yeah, so what's it going to start at? Yep, it's going to start at zero because I started it at zero here. And how high is it going to count up to? That's really close, but it's actually not going to get to a thousand. Yeah, it's going to go because once it's a thousand, it's going to check is my variable less than a thousand? It's going to say no, it's not. So it's not going to run that code. So if I upload it, Open the serial monitor. We should see. Okay, that's really fast. Hold on, let me put a delay in here. Uh, delay for a thousand seconds. That'll stop it. So see, it went up to nine 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 nine. Oh, and look, do you know why it's my delay is not working like I thought it would? It's actually, it's going once a second, it's printing them out. Because I forgot, delay is in milliseconds, not in seconds. So it's one second delay. So I need three more zeros, and then that's a thousand second delay. Let's see. That's weird. It's like it missed the first one. <laughs> Let me put a one second delay at the beginning so it doesn't miss it. There we go. So see, it starts up all the way up here uh, at zero, and then it counts all the way up to nine 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 nine. So, Exciting. yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. So, so every for loop in C has these three things. You have to set up your variable. You have to put a condition that's going to happen until that condition is no longer true, and then what? How you increment the variable? You could also say my variable equals 1000 while the variable is greater than 
10 and my variable minus minus. So does anyone have any idea what that's going to do? So wh what's the variables? Yep. Yep, exactly. So the minus minus, if you couldn't guess that, um, instead of adding one every time, it subtracts one every time. Uh, so we're starting at 100, and then every time we're going to check, is it greater than 10? So at first, it's obviously going to be greater than 10. Then we're going to subtract one, it's become 99. Is 99 greater than 10? Yep. And it's going to keep going until you get all the way down to 11, and then it's going to stop after 11. So you should see. Maybe, maybe not. Hmm. There we go. So yeah, it stopped at 11. Yeah. So that's really cool stuff, exciting parts of Arduino. Does anyone have any questions about those few things I covered about um, if statements and for loops? So let's look at... This was the code I posted online that made the XY stage move back and forth. So um, what do these two lines do that are pound sign or hashtag include? Uh, does that add the library? Yeah, so I'm using two libraries. In C, this is how you include a library. You do hashtag include and then the name of the library. And um, what, what about the, I didn't talk about this. What, is, what does it do if I? Uh, have a hashtag define encoder A is 12. And encoder B is 11. So it's almost going to be the exact same thing as if I did encoder A equals 12. Like int encoder a but define is is a weird thing in c where um this is actually never going to show up in the actual code when i hit compile it's telling the compiler hey read through the code and anywhere that you see encoder a like the the word encoder a replace it with 12 and then once you've done that then compile the code so it's kind of like you're not actually making a variable. You're just saying, anytime you see encoder A, you know you mean 12, actually. So it's, it's just a different way of doing it. So if you see that, don't get confused. It's, it's kind of equivalent. For our purposes, we could also just do int encoder B and encoder A. Um, like this would do almost the same thing. When people use... Um, defines instead of variables it's it's kind of a tradition that you make it all uppercase so that you are aware that it's a define it's just some weird i don't know why that is but that's how it's typically done um i guess it's like an agreed upon thing um so you don't get the mixed up. yeah yeah because sometimes i name make my variables all uppercase which is maybe not a good thing um Oh, one more thing I forgot to cover. So these are all data types. There's float, int32, boolean, int32. And if you have any questions about what these are, just Google them. And that's all. int32 is the same thing as int. It's just that um, it's a different way of writing it. And 
and you'll see both used kind of. Um, does anyone know what this volatile though means at the beginning? You're not often going to use this, but what it means is that this variable could change at any time. And the reason it could change any time is because I'm using an interrupt. If y'all remember the encoder, like when one of the encoder channels detects a step, um, I need to count that step. So I have something called an interrupt. And that interrupt, it tells the processor, like whatever you're doing, stop doing it and count this step so that you don't miss it. And these are all uh, prefixed with volatile because these variables change inside of an interrupt, inside of this interrupt. So like the processor might be like, say you're going to do something with position X and like you say, um, read position X and then a few lines later you read position X again. If you haven't done anything to it in that code, it's going to assume it hasn't changed because it's like I just read it and I didn't do anything to it. So it's, if it's 500 here, it's going to be 500 a little bit later. But because I have this interrupt, if that interrupt happens in between those two, um, it could change. So I'm letting the, I'm letting the uh, compiler know, hey, it's possible this could change at any moment. So don't like, sometimes it tries to be too smart for its own good and it's like, well, you haven't changed it. So I'm just going to assume it's equal everywhere as long as you haven't changed it. But that can cause problems. So, um, so um, a lot of this is like taken from examples. If you remember the um, this encoder stuff, it came from. If you go to. Um, the motor shield library, there's a encoder example right here. That's how I figured out how to do most of this, even the interrupt stuff. Um, so if, you, if you're like trying to remember all this stuff, just remember, look at the examples. Um, and the way that the interrupt is used is it's a function. It has a void return, which means it doesn't return anything. Um, and it, it would just be a normal function, except that this line right here is called attach interrupt. And it tells the um, microcontroller that anytime you see a rising edge on encoder A, you need to call this function right here. It doesn't have to be called interrupt. They just did that for convenience. So that encoder, if you remember, it's sending out pulses on um, channel A sending out pulses and then channel B is like lagging a little bit behind this is a and this is B so it's saying anytime you see a go from a 0 to a 1 up here call this function interrupt a and then what the function does is the first thing it does is it reads encoder B so it's like well a just went from 0 to 1 let's read B what is B and if B is zero, it means you're going forward. But if you're going backwards, it would go from zero to one. And then when you read B right here, B would be a one, so you know it's going backwards. So that's, that's how it tells the direction. And then um, we are writing an LED high, and then we're, we're having a variable called current A and setting it equal to mic micro, micro S. Does anyone know what micro S is with that function returns? So it actually stands for microseconds. And what it is, is this function, it, it tells you how many microseconds the, uh, feather has been running. So it's constantly going up. Like when you first start it, it's at zero. And then one second later, it's going to say a million because that's how many microseconds have gone by. And so um, 
you can use it to keep track of how much time has gone by. So like what they're doing is every time the interrupt happens, they're recording this the, how many microseconds and then um, the second time it happens they can subtract the current microseconds from the last one and they know hey between this one and this one it was you know a thousand microseconds that's one millisecond so you know how fast these pulses are happening um, so that's what they're doing here. They're saying this is how many microseconds went by. They're subtracting the two times. And then to get the RPMs, they're doing one divided by that. So that's how many revolutions per microsecond. And then they're multiplying by a million to get revolutions per second. Because um, th these are just like all of this is just converting it so that it has the right units pretty much. And then if there's any gearing or anything, you have to count for that. But it, but all this, it looks complicated, but all it's doing is it's checking which direction the motor's spinning, and then it's seeing how long elapsed between this edge and this edge, and that'll tell you how fast the motor's going. Um, and then before they exit, they if you remember, this has the current time in it, and so they they set the last time to the current time. Why would they do that? Why would they have this variable called last time and set it equal to the current time? Yeah, exactly. So like. Um, before they leave, they say, okay, save the current time in this thing called last time. So you've got last time maybe is uh, right here now. And then the next time this interrupt happens, it's gonna, this is going to be the current time. And they're going to subtract the two to get the, the time that uh, passed. Um, there's a couple, so that that's probably like the hardest part of this code is the interrupt because interrupts are normally not, they're kind of a more advanced topic, but they're really useful when you don't want to miss things that happened. Because um, like you could have in your code like a, a thing that's like constantly looping around and checking if this went from zero to one. But then, like, say that I want to move my stepper motor, and I, I start moving the stepper motor steps. While I'm doing that, and if I'm not using interrupt, I'm going to miss all of these, all these steps. So it's kind of like for really important things that you can't miss. Interrupts are really good for that. Um, and like I said, I don't expect you to remember this off the top of your head, but um, if you go to the this encoder RPM example, it'll have it. How to do it. Um, also like to let's see to use the uh, the motor driver you have to like call these two lines right here again I wouldn't want, expect you to remember that but if you go to the uh, the stepper or the motor shield library it'll have this in the example so this um this is a little bit of an advanced topic. This is like a C++ topic. It is, uh, it almost looks like a variable of type Adafruit motor shield that you're making. And that's kind of what it is. You're making an, it's called an object. So like it's making an Adafruit motor shield object. And then it's making a stepper motor object. Um, but like I said, don't worry too much about that. Just know you have to put those lines in there. And then once you do that, you can use the, the stepper. Like you can just say my motor arrow set speed and it'll set the speed to a certain speed. Um, but yeah, just kind of like look at how they do it and just copy their, their examples and that'll be the easiest way. Because I, I wouldn't know 
you ask me how do you set up a motor and make it step, I wouldn't know, but you have to do this, call these two, um, and then once you do that, you have to call Adafruit Motor Shield Begin, and then you can do things like set speed, and you can do um, steps forward and backward and stuff, but kind of like reading this, it gives you a hint as to how, do you, how you need to do it, so. All right, well, that's uh, a little bit over time, but that's, hopefully that was helpful going through just more coding with Arduino. Um, and and there's, it's great because there's so many examples online with Arduino. Like, if you have any questions, just if you want to know, even if it's like, I, I have this certain sensor, how do I talk to it with Arduino? Chances are someone else has used that same sensor with Arduino. You could probably find some example code or something similar. So, uh Hopefully that helps. And uh, if you haven't posted your project ideas, go ahead and do that. And um, we need to start getting going on those, especially if you need to order parts. Uh, and especially if you need to order parts through the school, because that can take a while, that process. So um, we, need to, we need to figure out what y'all are, what, what kind of stuff y'all need. Um, I might send out something this week that's like make an outline of your project and list any parts that you need or something like that so we can do that but yeah any more questions all right well thank thanks everybody Hope you all have a good thanksgiving you too. yeah don't eat too much turkey <laughs> <laughs>